what I was playing, lady. I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Lord Shaw and Mr. Worthy were dining with me. Eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. I yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households the champagne is rarely of a first rate wine. <coughs> Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't think I am very interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. It isn't a very interesting subject. I wouldn't think of it myself. For the best, <laughs> I'm sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat that. Really, if the lower orders don't set a good example, what on earth is the use of them? And they seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthy. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Archie. I believe it is customary in good society to have some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Got nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire? Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Uh, Shropshire? Yes, of course. Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Merely on to us, sir. And Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all right. But I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. Why, it's almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. <laughs> I am in love with Gwendolyn, and I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you'd come up for pleasure. I call that business. <laughs> How utterly unromantic you are. There is nothing romantic in proposing. However, it is very romantic to be in love. But there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. What? Maybe accepted. What usually is, I believe. But then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'll certainly try to forget that fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, well, there's no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. <laughs> Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They're made specially for Aunt Augusta. <laughs> well, you have been eating them all the time. That is an entirely different matter. She is my aunt. Uh, here, have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. And very good bread and butter it is, too. <laughs> My dear fellow, you need not eat as if you are going to eat at all. 
You ask as if you're already married. You aren't already married. And I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? In the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. They don't think it right. Oh, that is <laughs> nonsense. It is, it's a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. And besides, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Wendell is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, we must clear up a whole question of Cecily. <coughs> Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. Please bring me the cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room last time he dined with me. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say that you have had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you would let me know. I have been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would. I happen to be more than usually hard up. Well, that is no good, offering a large reward now that the thing is found. That is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. But, now that I look at the inscription on the inside, it is quite clear that the thing isn't yours at all. Uh, of course it's mine. You have seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to pre read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. Why, more than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I am quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my case back. Yes. But this isn't your cigarette case. It was a gift from someone of the name of Cecily. <laughs> and you said that you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you must know, <coughs> Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. A charming old lady she is too. <coughs> Lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algy. Yes, but well, why does she call herself Little Cecily if she was your aunt in the Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily with her fondest love. My dear fellow, <laughs> what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that all aunts should be exactly like your aunt. That is absurd. For heaven's sake, just give me back my cigarette case. Yes. And why should your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. I admit, there is no objection to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. <laughs> and besides, your name isn't Jack, it's Ernest. <laughs> My name isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. I've introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. <laughs> You're the most earnest looking person I ever saw in my entire life. And it's perfectly absurd. You're saying your name is not Ernest. Oh, why, it's on your cards. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany. I'll keep this as proof. You ever tried to deny the fact to me, to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else? Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. And the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily, <laughs> who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her uncle. Come on, old boy, it's much better to have the thing out at once. My dear Algie, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. 
It is very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. <laughs> that is exactly what dentists always do. Now go on, tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I've always suspected you of being a bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? Uh, what on earth do you mean by bunburyist? I will tell you the meaning of that incomparable expression as so, soon as you are kind enough to explain to me why your name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now produce an explanation and pray, make it improbable. My dear fellow, <laughs> there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Miss Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle for motives of respect that you cannot possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. I may, may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I have always suspected that. I have bunburied all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why are you, are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I don't know that you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in a position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high mortal on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as high mortal can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness. I have always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life will have a very tedious time if it were even. In modern literature, a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte. Don't try it. You should leave it to those who haven't been in a university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you are is a bunburyist. It's quite right in saying so. Why, you're one of the most advanced bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a useful younger brother in the name of Ernest, so that you may be able to visit town whenever you like. I have invented a commonly invaluable invalid called Bunbury, so that I may be able to visit the country whenever I like. Bunbury is perfectly valuable. And if it wasn't for this extraordinary bad health, I really wouldn't be able to die of you at Melissa tonight. For I have really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. But I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I uh, know. And so it has, you. Nothing annoys people more than not receiving invitations. <laughs> <laughs> I really think you would much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I have no intention of doing anything of the sort. In the first place, I dine with our Aunt Monday. And once a week is quite enough to die with good relations. In the second place, whenever I do go there, I am always treated as a member of the family and sit down with no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well that she will place me next to you tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. It's not very pleasant. In fact, it's not even decent. And this sort of thing is enormously on the increase the amount of married women in London who flirt with their own husbands. <laughs> Perfectly scandalous. <laughs> it's so bad, it's simply washing one's clean linen in public. And besides, now that I know you to be a Bunburyist, naturally, I want to talk to you about Bunbury. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, <laughs> I am 
going to kill my brother. <laughs> Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. <laughs> Cecily is a little too interested in him. <clears throat> it is rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest. And I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr. With your invalid friend who has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with one room. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you want to know Bunbury. A married man who doesn't know Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You seem to forget the fact that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, that the happy English home was proved in half the time. <laughs> for heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. It isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about it. Stuff. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. If I can get her out of the room for ten minutes to give you a chance of proposing to Gwendolyn, might I dine with you and Willis tonight? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people that aren't serious about meals. So shall with them. <laughs> Lady Bracknell and Miss Lambert. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you're behaving very well. I'm feeling quite well, Mr. Bustop. It's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two rarely go together. Well, dear me, you are smart. I'm always smart, aren't I, Mr. Whirling? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. <laughs> I'm sorry for a little late, Algernon. I was obliged to call upon the dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since the death of her poor husband. I've never seen a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. <laughs> now, I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Gwendolyn, won't you come sit here? Uh, thanks, Mama. I'm comfortable where I am. Good heavens! Lane. <laughs> oh, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers! <laughs> no, not even for ready money, sir. That will do, Lady. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers, not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury. Seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its color. And what cause? I, of course, cannot possibly say. Thank you. I have quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm setting you down next to Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman, and so attentive to her husband. It's a delight to watch her. I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta, that I will have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight. <laughs> I certainly hope not, Algernon. <laughs> it will put my table quite out. Your poor uncle will have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. <laughs> it is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment. But I have just received a telegram. It said that my friend Bunbury is quite ill. They seem to think that I should be with him. I find it very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad dogs. Yes. 
but really it's a dreadful thing for the... <laughs> well, I must say, Algernon, I think it's high time this Mr. Bunbury decided whether he was going to live or going to die. <laughs> this shouldn't shallying around with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of this modern sympathy for invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly something to be encouraged in others. <coughs> Health is the primary duty of life. I keep trying to tell my poor uncle. He never seems to take any notes. At least as far as his ailments goes. I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to please not have a relapse on Saturday. I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It's my last reception, and one wants something to encourage conversation, especially this late in the season when one has said practically whatever it is they were going to say, which, in most cases, was probably not much. <laughs> I will talk to Bunbury after Gusta, if he is conscious, and I think I can promise he'll be all right by Saturday. The music, however, is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll look over the arrangements I've drawn out for you. If you'll kindly accompany me into the next room. Thank you, Algernon. It's very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program will be delightful after a few explications. French music I simply cannot have. Everyone always seems to think it's improper. And they look shocked, which is vulgar. But alas. Uh, which is worse. <laughs> German seems a very respectable language, and indeed, I believe it is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthy. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. And I would like to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama always has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I often had to speak to her about. <laughs> Miss Fairfax, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met. Since I met you. Yes, I'm quite aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you've always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthy, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines. And has even reached provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that, it in, that inspires absolute confidence. The moment that Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you have made me. My own But you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. Oh, but your name is Ernest. Yes, I know it is. <laughs> But supposing it was something else, do you mean to say that you couldn't love me then? Yeah, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference, if any at all, to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care of the name of Ernest. I don't think it suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Quintlin, I must say there are lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance. A charming name. Jack? 
No, there is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all. I've known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jackson is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She must never know the intrinsic pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely. You know that I love you, Miss Fairfax, and you led me to believe that you were not quite so indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject hasn't even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. <laughs> Gwendolyn. Yes, darling. What have you got to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. <laughs> Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Oh, of course I will, darling. How long have you been about it? I'm afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. <laughs> My own one? You are the only one in the world that I have ever loved. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Joe does. All of my girlfriends tell me so. Oh, what wonderfully green eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite green. I hope you always look at me like that, especially when other people are present. Mr. Wood, rise from this semi-recumbent posture immediately. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must uh, beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing hasn't quite finished yet. Finished what, might I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, but you're not engaged to anyone. <laughs> when you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit, will inform you of the fact. <laughs> An engagement should come upon a young girl as a surprise. <laughs> pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be. It's hardly something she can be allowed to arrange for herself. Now, I have a few questions for you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, who wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. The carriage! Yes, Mama. you are not down on my list of eligible young men. <laughs> Even though I used the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton. We work together, in fact. I am, however, quite prepared to add your name should your answers prove to be what a truly affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. What is your age? Twenty-nine. Fine age to be married at. I've always been of the opinion that a man desiring to be married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I knew nothing, Lady Bracken. I'm pleased to hear it. 
I don't approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. <laughs> ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. <laughs> the whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England at any rate, education seems to produce no effect whatsoever. <laughs> if it did, it would prove a danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. Now then, what is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or investments? In investments, chiefly. That's satisfactory. <laughs> what were the duties expected from one during one's life? And the duties exacted from one after one's death. Land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That is all that can be said about land. Uh, I have a house in the country with some land, of course, attached to it. About 1,500 acres, I believe. But I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only ones who make anything out of it. Country house? How many bedrooms? That can be settled afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn can hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrove Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham. I do not know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She is a lady considerably advanced in years. These days, there is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I hope there was something. Oh, well, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. Now then, what are your politics? Well, I am afraid I really have none. I am a liberal unionist. Are those Countess Tories? They dine with us. Or come in the evenings at any rate. Now, on to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be seen as misfortune. To lose them both? Seems like carelessness. <laughs> Who was your father? He must have been a man of some will. Was he born in what the radical papers are calling the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? Well, I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. <laughs> Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. And where did this kindly gentleman with the first-class ticket to the seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? <laughs> yes, Lady Bracknell. I was found in a handbag. A somewhat large, brown leather handbag with handles to it. Perfectly ordinary handbag, in fact. And where did this Mr. James or, or Thomas Cardew find this ordinary handbag? The cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is a material. 
Mr. Worthing, I must confess I am somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred, in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, <laughs> seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I assume you know what that movement led to. As to the locality, cloakroom at a railway station might serve to hide some social indiscretion. Has probably been used for that before now. But it can hardly be regarded as a basis for a recognized position in good society. Well, may I ask you what you would advise me to do then? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to find some relations as soon as possible, and to produce, at any rate, one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. <laughs> it is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has this to do with me? You can hardly imagine Lord Bracknell and myself would allow our only daughter, a girl raised with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthy! <laughs> She's always refusing people. It's the most ill natured of her. And Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. Never met such a Gorgon. I don't actually know what a Gorgon is like. <laughs> but I am quite sure that Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk of your aunt in that way before you. My dear fellow, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct of when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. Well, that is what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. <laughs> you don't think that there is any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years? <laughs> Do you, Algy? All women become like their mothers. That's their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever? It's perfectly phrased. And quite an observation as any in civilized life should be. I am sick to death of cleverness. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. It's become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools. Oh, about the clever people, of course. <laughs> what fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl like Gwendolyn. <laughs> What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty and to someone else if she is plain. <laughs> that is nonsense. 
What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die quite suddenly from apoplexy, don't they? Yes. But that sort of thing is hereditary, my dear fellow. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say a severe chill. You are sure a severe chill isn't hereditary? <laughs> or anything of that kind? Quite sure. Very well. Poor Ernest was carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your brother. Won't she feel his loss a great deal? Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I am glad to say. She has a capital appetite, goes long walks, and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I'd like to meet this Cecily. <laughs> I will take very good care you never do. She is excessively pretty, and she is only just 18. Did you tell Gwendolyn that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? One doesn't blurt these things out to people. Gwendolyn and Ces Cecily are perfectly certain to become great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that half an hour after they have met, they will be calling each other sister. They will only call each other sister after they have called each other many other things first. <laughs> now, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and get dressed. Did you know it is nearly seven? It always is nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. Well, what shall we do after dinner? Shall we go to the theater? Oh, no, I loathe listening. Well, how about we go to the club? Oh, no, I hate talking. Well, how about we trot round to the Empire at ten? Oh, no, I can't bear looking at things. It is so silly. Then what shall we do? Nothing. Nothing. It is excessively hard work doing nothing. <laughs> but I don't mind hard work if there is no definite objective of any kind. Miss Fairfax. <coughs> Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Gwendolyn, I really don't think I can allow this. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude toward life. You're not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the look on Mama's face, I feel we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regards to what the children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. <laughs> Whatever influence I had from Mama, I lost at the age of three. But although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often, <laughs> nothing she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. The, your Christian name makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Now, your town address at the Albany I have, what is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. <laughs> There's a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. My own one. How long will you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn round now. Thanks, I've turned round already. <laughs> you may also ring the bell. But, but you will let me see you to your carriage, won't you? Certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir.
glass of sherry lane? Yes, sir. I'm going to Bunbury tomorrow, Lane. Yes, sir. I don't think I'll be back until Monday, so you can put up all of my dress clothes, smoking jackets, and all of the Bunbury suits. Yes, sir. Tomorrow is going to be a great day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, <laughs> you're a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. <laughs> There's a sensible intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. <laughs> what on earth are you so amused at? Nothing. I'm just worried about Bunbury, that's all. If you don't take care, Bunbury is going to get you into some serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They're the only things that aren't serious. That is nonsense. You never do talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. Ah. Uh -huh. 